So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Moreno and uh, we are from the in Portland. Uh, this morning we welcome Susanna Simoins. Many, many of you already met her in previous seminars uh, that we have had here in the United States. She is an international speaker. Uh, she comes from a spiritual a spiritist family and has been living here for the past 27 years, um, working diligently on the spiritist arena, but also helping others as a physical therapist as well. So today, uh, Susanna will be talking to us about self-knowledge and self-love, which is so important to know how to know ourselves, but also use of self-compassion um, because we cannot be compassionate with others if we are not compassionate to ourselves. So with that, we give uh, a, a warm welcome to Susanna, thanking you, Susanna, for being with us. Thank you, Anna. Um, good morning, everyone. It's uh, lunchtime here, but um, good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, very excited to be um, here today talking to you all. I've seen uh, probably some of you around the conferences, but I don't feel like I know you. So it's a great opportunity to spend a little bit more of time and um, and get to know you all a little bit more. It takes a lot of pleasure in in um, expanding the spiritual family. I was recently in um, Texas and um, for the uh, for the U.S. Spiritist Federation um, seminar, and it was such a joy to see everyone and um, our spiritual family who we haven't had the opportunity to see for a long time because of COVID, it was um, really a true joy. So I'm very happy to be here today to bring you this topic that is very uh, dear to my heart because it's very much part of what I, I seek to do every day. It's uh, uh, part of, of the work that I um, am very committed to perform um, myself. So I like to start by bringing the idea of God because God is the beginning. And so it's the, the reference. So when we start with God, we go back to the definition that we have of God which we know that God is the supreme intelligence of the universe, but God has also been defined as love by John the Evangelist. And if we are God's image, that means that we too are intelligence and love. And I think those two words they define very well our, our nature. So we are the intelligent principle and our essence is an essence of love, just like, uh, just like God. So there is, a, I have a few passages here that I'll be sharing with you. One is from the spirit, Gias da Cruz. He's the one who, um, writes to the psychography of Andre Moreira, and Andre Moreira is an author that has some of his books published and translated in English, and it's, it's definitely worth knowing. Um, but Gias da Cruz, in one of the books, he will say that love is the natural structure that defines the being. It's like a well nourishing the soul from its depth until it reaches the surface in the form of a blessed spring, generating life and quenching the thirst of all beings. I love very much this definition. To think that we have a well of love in the depths of our soul and that that love springs on the surface and quenches 
as he says, uh, the thirst of all beings, ours and everyone else who is around us. I think it's such a beautiful, a beautiful image that he brings um, and that he speaks again to our essence of love. Just like him, Joana de Angelis also has um, a statement that speaks about love being our nature. But she says that love in us patiently awaits to be awakened. We possess it in the innermost of our beings, but we do not know it. And there is the need of the other to awaken in us the awareness and to reveal the incomparable value of these treasures. So here's one is saying that, yes, we have this well of love within us, but it's unknown to us, the, the, the depth, the grandiosity uh, of it. And in order to awaken this awareness, we need someone else. So this brings us to the realm of relationship, which remains up to this day, the greatest challenge that we have in our humanity. We have conquered a lot of things, but we have yet to conquer the realm of relating. And when we think about relating, we think about our relationship with ourselves, but also with our neighbor and also with God. And we know that the law says that we have to love God above all and our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so we talk a lot about that, but at the end of the day, is how do we do this? How does it look like this process? What goes into it? And I think spiritism helps us by giving us like an, an initial idea when it says that the most important um, way to overcome our um, bad, evil tendencies is to know ourselves. So that's kind of the starting point. And I think it's very important because the spirits could have answered anything to Kardec. They could say, well, if you want to overcome the darkness in you or whatever you want to call it, you have to pray a lot. You have to study a lot. You have to attend the mediumship group, the Andrew Lewis study group, and all the study groups of your center. But that was not the answer. The answer is the most efficient way to progress and to overcome our tendencies is to know ourselves. So knowing ourselves, how do we do that? So it calls for inner awareness and inner attention. So it is our ability to be observant of our own nature, of our own reality on a moment to moment basis. So the challenge that we have um, in terms of our evolution is that as we begin to evolve, we naturally had to look outwards because we were seeking to understand the world that we were living in. We need to make sense of the things that we were seeing so we could place ourselves and have a sense of what this place and this reality is about. So in terms of evolution, we have evolved outwards. We have gained a lot of understanding of the material reality that we are inserted. but. It comes to a point in the evolution of the being that the being realizes that the happiness, the, the harmony, the, the joy, the contentment that we experience in life has to do, or, or even how we perceive the world outside, has a lot to do 
with our inner world. So at this point, we kind of kind of take a little leap in our evolutionary process from just looking outwards to understand the importance and how key it is to understand also inwards. When we, within the paradigm of looking outwards, we have been and adding the realm of relationships so how does that look like into the realm of relationships is what Jesus brought us in the gospel when he says that, you know, here we are looking at the moat in our brother's eyes when we have a beam in our own eyes. So in the realms of relationships, we have not done a very good job because we still very much into this mode and into this habit of looking outwards. We are starting to um, learn and understand what involves to look inward and to really take responsibility for everything that we experience by asking what is my part, what is my contribution? How am I part of this problem? <laughs> because before is, you know, A, B, C are creating a problem as if we were never even part of the problem. So we are, we are getting to this place which is characterized by a spiritual maturity. So understanding that the perception of the outside mirrors our internal reality. And this is where self-love comes in. So self-knowledge and self-love, what is the relationship between these two? When we decide, when we understand that we need to go inwards, that's when we need to call and we need to lean on self-love. So that the journey inwards does not become one that crushes us, does not become one that is um, packed with judgment and with punishment. Going inwards is naturally painful for the ego because the ego wants to be at the top of the, the world wants to feel good about itself. So going inward is very challenging for the ego. And in this challenge, there is a natural pain to the process, the pain of the breakdown of illusion, the pain of seeing yourself, how you truly are, as opposed to all these ideas and identifications that we have with the material reality. So it's painful in itself for us in our level of evolution, but it can become excruciating when through the natural pain of the process, we add all the suffering that comes with judgment and with punishment. So the journey inwards starts from our relationships. So they are the beginning, they're the middle, and they are the end of the process. And it's really what moves us, spiritually speaking. So something, you know, um, a few days before Thanksgiving to be grateful for our relationships, all of them, the, the good and the bad ones, the easy and the difficult ones, the loving and the challenging ones, because they are the very source of our a spiritual evolution. We couldn't be where we are were, wasn't for the, the, the people and the relationships that brought us to, to where we are at the present uh, moment. So, and it becomes instrumental because a lot of times the other is going to be a mirror for areas in ourselves that we are unable to see. So 
one example that I like to, to, to give is with rigidity, for example. And I, I speak of rigidity because I find myself to be very rigid at times. And it's one area that I'm working in myself. I have a, a, a brother who is, um, who is very rigid. And when I'm relating with him, there are moments where I feel very irritated, angry, maybe. And every time I am able to, to realize, to be present, and to realize that my emotion, my feeling in that moment is one of irritation and anger and I'm I'm labeling him as rigid, he is mirroring my own rigidity because I am too being rigid in my point of view. So it's really it's really helpful to that's how relationships are so helpful in in mirroring so I wouldn't necessarily say spontaneously that I'm rigid, but in relationship, and as we have those difficult feelings, feelings, emotions are messengers. That's how we, we I think it's a really nice way of thinking of them. Um, I like to think the emotions are God's voice within us. Um, they, they deliver, to our consciousness, messages, they're powerful and we need to pay attention to them because in paying attention to them lies our best possibilities and opportunities for, for transformation as we will uh, get there. But there are parts in us that we don't like, that we, we don't care for, that we would be likely um, ashamed or we would feel um, inadequate if we would disclose them and we hide them. We, we have uh, a psychological mechanism that puts those things um, in our unconscious and so we don't have to deal with that. And we move on in life believing that we are, we are not that, although that's there. And so again, the relationships are going to be precisely everything that we see in someone that we hate, that we despise, usually is information for us. Usually is, as we say in, in English, it's grist for the mill. So it is material, it is information about our own selves. And Alberto Almeida, who is a Brazilian uh, doctor and speaker, he has a, a statement in one of his lectures where he said, self-love proposes that we love in ourselves what bothers us in others. So self-love proposes that we love in ourselves what bothers us in others. So whatever we see that is bothering us, if somebody else, I'll give you another example. Um, one thing that bothers me is powerlessness. Sometimes I see someone who is powerless and a little bit on the victim and um, kind of attitude and that really, really irritates me. So then I, I asked myself, you know, what is the relationship? I mean, what, what, what does powerless mean to me, right? And that bridged me to my, to my uh, story, to my, to my past, to my family, to uh, early relationships. And in going into that, I'm able to, to have a better understanding why that is so unacceptable for, to me. And so, again, that's just an example on how, um, you know, that can help us to, 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 to see, to cope, and to embrace those areas as opposed to be pushing them away um, 
as we as we more uh, normally do. So uh, for me, weakness, rigidity, uh, powerlessness, uh, sometimes feelings um, in the area of sexuality. We see in others, we judge, we have strong feelings. Then we should stop and think, what does that mean to me? You know, and and help us. These emotions they become bridges bridges to areas in ourselves that we may not be as um, aware. So the ideal, what we're here looking to accomplish is to be able to love ourselves in totality. And like I mentioned, relating is going to create those little bridges that will, stepping stones that will help us to, to skip into areas that we need to get. Again, it's easier if we go in with self-love. Self-love is going to call for courage, capacity to see, ability to tolerate, and acceptance. So those are four steps that are embedded in the idea of self-love that I wanna talk a little bit about because as we think about them, uh, they are helpful. They will be helpful in helping us to to go in a little bit more easily with a little bit more of oxygen and a little bit more resources to bear the journey. So let's start with courage. Courage means core from the heart. So we need to be engaged in this process of self-transformation and self-knowledge, not only with our cognition. Oh, yes, I want to get to know myself. Um, yes, I want to go to Astro City in North Solar. I need to be a better person. That's all cognitive. It needs to be something like from the heart. I, you are convinced, but your conviction that this is the path cannot be only cognitive. You have to be engaged in the process with your soul. You have to be, it's not about knowing, it's about to be deeply convinced that this is the path for happiness. And to be also sometimes kind of exhausted of the, the current situation. And so, so exhausted that you're finding yourself that drive to look for something that can hold you in a more perennial basis. So from the core, I'm ready to enter the arena. I love this expression that is from Brene Brown. Um, I'm, 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 I, I'm ready to enter the arena to expose myself, to, to bear whatever it is. Um, because I know that this is going to take me to a better place. So the second step is capacity to, to see. So like we were saying, um, it, it calls for a level of awareness. Um, so when you are in a heated situation, in a conflict, in, in difficult relationship, you, you, you're going to have to open spaces to see, to be present to um, to focus on your own self, pull back to yourself. Okay, I'm here struggling, angry, pissed, whatever it is, but full of resentment. Um, but wh wh where is the being, right? Where is the being? Let me, let me, let me see what, what, what are the feelings? Let me make a list of the feelings. What, does, what do these feelings mean? And so this way we start to focusing in the right direction. We start like, first you had the courage. You, you put yourself in the arena, meaning you were ready to look at yourself. You were ready to expose, to be naked, uh, emotionally speaking. And then second, okay, let me look, let me analyze, let me be curious about my own feelings and what's happening within me. The third step, is really, really important. Once you see, okay, I'm angry. I'm really angry. Um, anger is a, is, a, is a defense mechanism. Um, it helps when you're angry, really angry, you feel big. You feel 
powerful. Um, so anger usually helps is a defense mechanism for moments where you're feeling very small because people are not doing what you want. You don't have control over the situation. You're trying to get people to, to do things one way and they don't want to do it. And the ego hates when people don't agree with it. Um, or you're not being seen. Your perception is of not being seen, not being valued. All these things generate a lot of anger. So once you see that, okay, I'm angry, but truly, truly behind the anger, what I'm feeling is like completely devalued, for example. And, and, and that feeling takes you to, let's say, moments in your childhood where you wish your parents had been there for you and seen you ways that they didn't. Now you're getting more and more into the human realm into the frailty area. And the third step is you need to tolerate that. What happens when we enter painful realms? A lot of times you say, I need to have a hot plate of pasta, right? Because what does hot plate of pasta does and does very well, it soothes us. It's like, it's, it's, it's good. or you may say, I need to, oh, well, you know what? Let me, let me, let me prepare uh, the study for the center. Let me, let, me, let me finish this project at work. Let me go back to the gym and work out for an extra hour. So a lot of times we will make ourselves busy somehow, not to feel. Sometimes we'll open a glass of wine because we will numb that feeling, we'll numb that pain. Um, and many different ways in which we can numb uh, our sadness and all the discomfort feelings that comes from the process of self-awareness. So ability to tolerate is important. Why? Because you can only transform what you see. You can only overcome what's there to be dealt with. Once you push it away to work, to food, to alcohol, whatever it is, to work out, to excessive time at the spiritual center, all those things do that, then you're stealing from yourself the best opportunity to for transcendency because you just push away the very feeling that you need to address, that you need to deal with. So ability to bear to sit with the discomfort is extremely important. Okay, Susanna, so what's next? The next step is acceptance. And this is the key. This is the key uh, for the process. And to accept is not to want to move, to change. Oh, how? No, but now it got really me confused here. What do you mean not want to change? So let's Let's think about um, this. You tell your significant other that uh, you accept him or her as he or she is. And the next morning, you wanted them to, to change the way they are, they are doing things or whatever. So I'm gonna ask you, did you, really, did you really accept that person the way he or she is? Is that, is that, what is the definition of acceptance, right? So we need to think about that because we say that we accept in the next second, we wanna change the person. So it might be news to you, but you did not accept the person. You still wanting the person to be something else. Okay, so how does that relate to what we are talking about here? So acceptance is to make peace with the human that you are. Acceptance is the opposite of wanting to change. But how am I gonna evolve if I am not committed to change? No, you are committed to change, but you are committed to real change. If I, if I say um, I am selfish, 
I don't want to be selfish anymore. I'm going to change because religion tells us that we need to be good people. And so what we do is when we realize that, for example, we are selfish, we change the behaviors so that now we convince ourselves and others that we are no longer uh, selfish. This is different, for example, and I promise I'll pull this together for you at the end, that will make sense. So for example, you married to someone and um, you, you were selfish and your wife, your husband said, you know, you were very selfish. What do you do with that? You say, if you were in the process of self-knowledge and self-love, you say, you know what? I truly am. I truly am. And I am sorry that I am. I, I'm really, I'm really trying to learn. I'm trying to, to do better, but this is, this is where I am right now. Uh, the next day you get up and you prepare a beautiful breakfast and uh, to the person to amend the relationship, but you're not preparing the breakfast because you became a better person. You're preparing the breakfast because you are a selfish person and you know that. And you are doing that because despite of being selfish, you want to tell that person that he or she is important to you. But you are not, you are not uh, believing the next morning that you are no longer a selfish person. You continue to be. That's a work for a lifetime. And you accept that, but you also will be engaged in doing things that can help improve in the relationships without the illusion that just because you're doing something external, different, that has changed your inner reality. So um, religion a lot of times has been um, kind of doing a little bit of this favor for us when they when we have in our minds this idea that every day we have to wake up and be a better person. What does that do to us? It tells us that we are not enough, that we are inadequate in our humanity, and it fuels us with feelings of inadequacy and also shame. And shame is very powerful. So a lot of us need and struggle with feelings of inadequacy and shame. And when um, religion tells us that what you are, who you are today, it's not good enough. So coping with that really affects our self-esteem and um, our relating with ourselves and with others. What if I tell you that, yes, you are good enough. Yes, you are divine. And yes, you are absolutely the best version of yourself at this moment. And that is totally okay. So this perception allows us to sit with whatever it is that we are and to feel at the same time the humanity and the divinity coexisting because to be human is also to be divine. We have this pressure in our mind that we should be perfect spirits. And yes, we will be perfect spirits, but it will take many, 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 many incarnations because when you go back to the, to the gospel or the spirits book and you look at the class of spirits, you're gonna see that even in the good realms, in the good world uh, where goodness prevails by far, there is still the existence of evil in a much smaller scale, but it's still there. So it's not something that we are going to get rid of tomorrow or in 10 lives. It's something that's going to be a long process. So acceptance, different than what we think, is not a passive process. There's a lot of work going into acceptance. There is a lot of action because acceptance is loving, is embracing of who we are, this beautiful, imperfect, broken, and divine version that each one of us is. And if we are capable to love the human in us, 
what happens when we look at the others. We are now much more capable of loving and embracing the human in others, not thinking that that person is worth less, but he's just as divine as I am. So there are a couple ingredients within acceptance. They are very important. And um, they are dignity, respect, and humility. So the ingredients of acceptance. So first thing, as I'm saying here, it's important that we feel that we are worthy. And one of the most beautiful passages that I find from the gospel um, that Jesus uh, teaches us is when he brings us the parable of the workers of the vineyard in Matthew 20. And he's going to say that uh, the father, the father uh, comes out several times throughout the day looking for workers uh, to join him in the vineyard. And what is really interesting just to start here is that Jesus is going to portray God as a king in many um, in many parables. But here, God is portrayed as the Father, which has a very loving um, component to to this God in this parable. And he goes out many times during the day, and he's going to find the workers of the first hour. And with these workers, that in spiritism, we usually uh, tend to think, oh, those were the, the most prepared ones. And perhaps they were, they had qualifications, they had skills that allowed them to be recruited in the very first hour. But what we don't talk so much is that from all the workers that were recruited throughout the entire day, those guys were the ones and the only ones with whom Jesus settle a deal for payment of one denarius. He goes back the second hour, the third hour, and the workers of those hours agreed to join him for whatever he thought would be fair to be paid for. So there was no commercial agreement with these other workers until the last hour. The last hour were the workers who were the least skilled. They were there. They were there in the market for the whole day. And no one had approached them. No one had recruited them for the work. But the father goes there. And although he was aware of their limited skills, he still brings them to work in the vineyard. And when it's time to pay, he starts paying these guys first, the last hour workers, and he gives them the same payment of the workers of the first hour. What did the workers of the first hour do that actually show us that they were not as morally evolved as we like to think? They questioned the goodness of the father. They questioned the justice of the payment. They will say, those were hired less. Those who were hired less worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who bore the burden of the work in the heat of the day. And the father is going to say, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for Daenerys? Take a pay and go. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the workers of the first hour is very powerful, the question. Those who were hired last hour, only those who were hired last work only one hour. And you have made them equal to us. So the Big lesson that we get here is that for God, for this father, it does not matter when you enter the vineyard. It does not matter how skillful you are or not. It does not matter where you are in your evolution. You, you are worth one denarius, just like 
everybody else. And I think that this is, it's funny because every time I say this, and I'm saying this now, um, I get so emotional because I think that our humanity suffers so incredibly from this pressure of evolution, of goodness, of standards that have been placed for us. And it is so incredibly painful, our struggle in the realm of self-acceptance and self-love that really becomes a barricade to, to, to connecting with our own humanity, which is the only way of transcendence and of real evolution here. So this passage tells us of our dignity it shows that our dignity is not on what we do, is the fact that we are a child of God, that alone makes us um, dignified beings. And our worth, our value is not, again, on what we do, but is in simply existing. The day that God wants us to exist, the day that God's love uh, created us, we became uh, valuable. Uh, and worth it of, of love, of, of um, belonging, which is a, a huge craving of the human soul. So <clears throat> this, this sense of, uh, of dignity, it gives us strength. It really empowers us to, it gives us the ground, the basis to, to go inwards and, and to deal with whatever it is without um, feeling less, without feeling inadequate, without shame. And respect is a legitimate expression of love. It's something that we know very little about, um, whether we're talking about the elections in the Brazil or the elections in the US. I think the spiritist, uh, the spiritist movement failed miserably in, um, in understanding what respect is, because I can say, um, and, and the world is becoming so polarized, it, it, it's, it's become even more and more of a challenge. But when I say I respect you, but yet inside I despise uh, what I see and, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm like disgusted with your understanding of life. Um, these are these are uh, uh, antagonists to respect because respect is to be able to see someone who differs than you and understand that that person remain, remains worth it, uh, valuable, um, divine. You respect their point of view because their point of view tells about their story, about their trajectory about the ability to perceive the world from their own journey, from their own history of pain, of trauma, of, you know, and of interest, because we all interest, we all have our self-interest that drives us in everything. So when you, when you look at someone who is different and you, you feel that person is equal to you, that is respect and that is love something that we are, again, it's quite foreigners uh, to us. So respect confers the other dignity, visibility, consideration of place and belonging. So you are different, but I still see you. I see you. I consider you. I, I, there is a place for you and you belong just the way I belong. And self-love looks at the, 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 the many, because we have many incarnations within ourselves, we have many personalities within ourselves, we have areas within ourselves. So respect looks at all that complexity, that crowd of Susanas within myself and think that each one of them, each one of the characteristics are there that personas is worth is being seen is considered and it belongs it has a place inside me 
So it's a practice that we do inwards, but we also do outwards towards the audience. In the last aspect, in closing, right, right on time, I love to be on time, is uh, humility. So humility comes from humus. So humus is the very uh, uh, fertile environment uh, that fertilizes the soil of the human heart and is key to self-encounter. How so? Humility allows us to, to look at all this stuff, bear all this stuff, embrace the human in us, and realize that we are indeed this little. Uh, so when I, when I see the smallness in myself, I'm able to step down from the top of the podium where the ego places us. And now I see myself in my immense humanity with my incredible limitations, with the uh, immense areas where I still need to, to work. And it changes the way I relate with myself, but it changes the way I relate with others. Because the way that we relate most commonly is vertically. I look down or I look up, but most of the times in our relationships, for example, gossiping. When I gossip, I talk bad about someone, which constitutes the bulk of our conversations in our humanity. We're always talking about somebody else. And as I put somebody else down, what that means is I am different than you. I have no business with you and you are below me. So that's what gossip does. Emotionally, it puts us in a higher position and the relating is vertical, it's from top down. The moment that I see, well, that person is so vain. But then I realize that I too am a vain person. Maybe I'm not vain in the way I dress myself, but my, I'm vain in, in my job. I'm vain in the way I deliver things because those feelings, those passions as we, we find in the spirit's book, pride, selfishness, difficulties in the sexual area, all, all those things belong to all of us. Uh, sometimes in different levels for different people, but belong to all of us. So when I realize my smallness, I'm now changing the nature of my relationships. Instead of relating vertic uh, vertically, I'm going to relate horizontally. And that makes a huge difference in, in again, the relating. I'm relating horizontally with my own self. I'm relating horizontally with others, which allows me to relate vertically and more closely and more strongly with God who is above us all. So in closing, in closing, when, when I am committed to get to know myself and I add to the journey, I take as my main uh, way of transportation, the vehicle of self-love, it improves my relationship with my own humanity. And in doing so, improves my relationship with others. And in improving my relationship with others, improves my relationship with God. The moment that I step down from the top of the podium and I'm able to embrace the human in myself with love and with compassion, that moment is a transformative moment. If I am more generous with myself, I am going to be more generous with my brothers and sisters. So notice that my initial intent was not to be better. I don't start my day saying, today I want to be good. I start my day by saying, today I want to be myself. Today I want to be able to hold hands with my own versions with my own limitations and and be with them and and, and engage in the feelings and and 
and, and, and be curious because as we get to the, to the core of the issues and we, we feel them, I can't explain with words sometimes, but that in itself transforms us. That in itself is a very powerful uh, experience that's not a cognitive experience, but it's an emotional experience that takes us, that shifts us to a different place. And the outcome of all of this, the natural outcome is that we become more compassionate, more loving human beings. Again, without that ever being the intention, but that being the natural outcome of self-love and, uh, and self-knowledge. So I hope that I was able to convey properly the, the, the thinking behind the connection between self-love and self-transformation. And I'm passing back to you guys for your, for your comments. Thank you so much, uh, Susanna. That I, I took so many notes on uh -huh. what you were saying um, as you were. Um, let me just uh, remove you from spotlight so we have everyone here. Um, as you were explaining or talking about the the pathway, and uh, there, I, I took like many things that I was thinking about. First, this. The, the when you mentioned you know Brené Brown and the arena, kind of us thinking about uh, putting ourselves out there and uh, showing our vulnerability and how hard it is to really leave our ego behind, right? And sometimes that's the this ego is basically the root cause for all the surface that we have, just because we put this, you know, unimaginable pressure on us. Um, masks or you know just the fear of failing and and we we have a hard time to really stay naked in front of the mirror as you said right yeah um, yes it's a it's a but you know what Anna, it's a very freeing feeling and mm -hmm. you know um i have another lecture that you know it's on my all my social media um but uh, it's called Attitude, and is where I share a personal experience um, with a relationship that I was very, very challenged, and I had a lot of really strong feelings to overcome. And I, I did this lecture in many places, and the, the reaction was it was always the same. People would say to me. Thank you so much for sharing your vulnerability and and um, how courageous you are to say mm -hmm. those things, mm -hmm. um, you know, in in a lecture. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is that uh, it's just it's just when you when you can't talk about the human in you without shame is amazing it's amazing it's just like again it's so free you know it's funny I, I like to joke being a gay woman you know I had a process of coming out of the closet like um you know nowadays it's easier but um you know I'm <laughs> easier too, easier so right <laughs> easier but not easy um but it's the same with our humanity, you know. I, I the day I did the lecture, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm now my human being is coming out of the closet because we are all closeted in our humanity, if you will. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we have always to be presenting our, our best version to society and um, or the accepted version. Uh, but I think we need to 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 be able. And the spiritual center is a place where. I think has a huge responsibility of, you know, embracing. being, yeah, embracing and, 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 you know, we have to, to develop a level of comfort with the human in us actually to be able to embrace the human in somebody else. 
So I think it's it's a task that we have to to to, to undergo here. Yeah, and I can relate to that. Um, I was diagnosed with lupus about ten years ago, mm -hmm. and I had a pretty right career at that time. And so mm -hmm. that, I, I need to take that picture down that is over there uh, on my my profile. But it and then I started writing a blog talking about lupus and you know all the inner journey that I had to go through and the pain. I mean, the physical pain and the challenges mm -hmm. and having to stop working and completely changing my routine. And, um, and then I, and, and I can see exactly what you said, because for many people, that was such a, a proof of courage of me kind of a sharing that mm -hmm. deep amount of vulnerability, right? right. And mm -hmm. I would say that for many years, in my blog, I didn't have my name, mostly because I was too working on the corporate world where I do need to be brave and courageous and strong and blah, right. blah, blah. So how can I show that? Right. And, um, but it takes, as you said, I think it, it takes us a lot of strength, inner strength, to be able to expose yourself in a level like that, that you don't feel weak. Yeah, it's that's not why you that why we we expose the vulnerability, but but sometimes kind of showing that we are all humans, and you know the fact that you have your scars and um, that doesn't make you, as you said, less than others, right? Yes, yeah. And um, and I really love the way that you talked about uh, the vineyard. And uh, you put in a way that I that I have never thought about. Mm -hmm. um, I too come from my spirit family and uh, been kind of uh, since I was inside my mom's belly, and and I always think about like the the last hour workers like right. us, right? So the ones that had been you know just kind of uh, going incarnation after incarnation just kind of uh, skipping the ground and not doing what mm -hmm. we're supposed to do right so when mm -hmm. you compare ourselves with Emmanuel you know we see right. Emmanuel right there and we're still here right, right. so there's, right. we are not doing something right but the way that you said that for God posed as a father and mm -hmm. a father for me is a figure of strength and mm -hmm. love at the same time right so it's like the uh, you know you know, no cut corners, you're going to do what you're going to do, but I love you anyways, right? So I have your yeah. back, but you still need to do what you got to do. Um, and then showing that that love, that reward per se, which is kind of a payment for the work day, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I always thought in terms of not quantity versus quality, but the way that you position it is that no matter, you know, where you are, how your skill set is, mm -hmm. you know, because those, the last guys, it's not that they didn't work. No, they didn't want to work. No, they were there. It's just that you said they were not really, they didn't yeah. have much expertise. So they, they couldn't find work, but right. they were open to work, which I think mm -hmm. is that's the, the important point for us is that we need to be open to yes. available to do the best we can, right? Yes. And, and, and yes. with that, we get the reward. So it doesn't matter if you kind of an academic level, if you're like three PhDs or you, you have not finished middle school, you're available, you're open, you get the reward, right? Yeah, whether, whether, whether you're talking about Jesus, us, or the warm in the ground. Yeah. The, the value is the same. Yeah. We're just in different places of our journey. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that we need to, to, to connect with this idea um, to help us to, to, to bear, right, uh, where we are. Um, you know, the, the workers of the last hour, they, they, they had not been chosen, but they also had not lost hope because they mm -hmm. were still there waiting. So I, I also like that idea, you know, yeah. it's like, 
it, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what it looks like. But that is one key component uh, that is very important for us as human beings and that really keeps us standing. It's never to lose hope of what is to come. Mm -hmm. And there is another idea that I usually throw in these lectures and I um, didn't mention today, um, which is, um, I also like to think the idea that when you think of like a child, like a second grade child, um, the handwriting of a second grade child, it's not pretty necessarily. But that is, but that is the best version that that child can do. The child knows deep inside or, or knows that uh, he and she or she will be able to have a better handwriting. Um, mm -hmm. So the potential is there, but there's no shame. Mm -hmm. in that handwriting because that is the appropriate handwriting for a second grade child so we shouldn't be ashamed of you know our misspellings it is where we are right as long as we are but we also know that we have the potential to write a beautiful thesis which we will do one day we're doing it uh which is the thesis of our own making and so um but you have to start from somewhere. So the first drafts are full of misspelling and um, maybe it's not pretty, but one day it will be a, a really, really wonderful story to be told. And, and kind of uh, tying into that, and then I will open the floor for other people to comment and make questions. Um, when you're talking about shame and that we are good and not good enough. And it, I like the way that you also position kind of a, this acceptance of who we are, where we are, but the acceptance not as something passive, right? So mm -hmm. to accept is not to be paralyzed. It's not inertia. It's not like, okay, let's, you know, let uh, life happen. No, acceptance is something very full of energy, I would say. It's yeah. a conscious. So, okay, this is who I am. Now what, right? Yeah, um, but it's and, work. Uh, it is work, exactly. It is work, and I think a lot of people think, okay, it's like faith. Okay, I I pray to God, and then He's gonna do everything. No, <laughs> mm -hmm. we do first. We do our part. So I right. look for answers. I look for a cure. I look for a better life. I work to be able to have food, clothes, and a and a lodging, you know, a roof on top of my head, and then God will provide. It's not me mm -hmm. sitting down and just waiting, right? So this right. acceptance is the same thing. I do the work, the inner work, as you um, explained, and uh, and then the help comes, right? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So does anyone have any comments, anything that you want to say? Jace. Um, first of all, thank you, Susanna. That was amazing. Uh, yeah. I've had a lot of like mind blowing insights here. Uh -huh. uh, but I guess my question or comment or just uh, for a discussion is I feel like um, self knowledge, self love, it's not a new concept, but um, for many, you know, as other many. Uh, topics in, in our current society, it's been more popular, right? People right. have been talking more about in late years. It's not like I didn't grow up with those lessons, like very clear on, on the media or on, on in any way, right? About self-love. And, and we all know like psychologically how our journey goes, right? When we are children, we, we don't care. We're just ourselves. And then when you come into those teenage years, we start having that feeling that you you refer to a little bit on on trying to belong to a group and then you start like kind of hiding who you really are because you're ashamed and then you get to your adult life and you go through all those insecurities that you go i guess my question is now that we have access to much more content and and people are more open even like people that are um famous in the media like a Brene Brown's of life like we see people talking about it being vulnerable and bringing that to 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 the day-to-day -day. I guess my question is do you have any insights on how can you we help the new generation like we know that the children that are coming now they are already different 
and they are coming to a different world. But as parents, um, I sent some of, of the people here in this call, mm -hmm. how can we how can we help uh, the children of the new generation of continue in that journey and, and show it and bring those concepts early in life? And I say it from my own experience, like I've started thinking about that, like after my 30s something, right? I've, like really looking into the mirror, seeing the real you, accepting who you are, but more than that, loving who you are. Um, I don't want to say late, but later in life, right? Um, how can we help this new generation to come to feel? Because I, because I also think that comes with confidence and maturity. Because yeah. it gets to a point in life that you really don't care really what other people it's think. It's funny, funny that you're bringing this up because this morning I was sitting, having breakfast with my wife, and um, we were talking about our kids, and uh, she, she's a psychologist, and so. Um, she hates social media, but she joined um, Instagram because the kids are watching so much TikTok and sometimes they send stuff that's like really funny and she wanted to be able to engage with them. She wanted to be able to send them some things they're funny to that she thinks are, and, and, and every day or very often she sends me something that uh, she finds uh, related to, you know, how we can better relate to the kids. And this week she sent me um, an Instagram of a psychologist that is amazing. Amazing. It's very short, but it's so powerful. It's so like about emotional awareness and how we talk to our kids, how we empower them, how we are empathic to them, as opposed to that approach full of criticism and judgment that really affects their self-esteem and I, I'm having breakfast with her and I said you know I felt like total failure total failure as a parent up to this point I mean <laughs> we have <laughs> failed oh miserably and then I thought about the things that I do different than my mother so for example I will lose with my kids. This week I put in uh, on my Instagram a testimonial about anger. Like, and it has to do with like, you know, sometimes just losing it with my children. And, but what I do differently than my mom didn't do is I am able to reflect about what happened and I'm able to remediate. I'm able to amend. I'm able to sit down with my kid and say, you know what? I really, really messed up. And I really, really want to ask you to forgive me because no matter what you were doing, the fact that I screamed has to do with me. I lost control. I didn't have inside myself the resources to manage things better. It has nothing to do with you. And I have done that a million times. I don't remember ever, ever in my lifetime, my mother asking me forgiveness for anything. So, you know, so I listen to the psychologist and I'm like, man, <laughs> I'm like, bad, bad, bad. But then I am able to appreciate the things that I can already do different. And the best thing that I can do for my children is to continue to educate myself. You know, it's, it's we're in an imperfect world. So a lot of the things that I do, the way I act has to do with the way I was raised is what I know to be a mother emotionally from my mother. Well, my mother did her best based on the education that she received from my grandmother who also did her best. But in that way, you know, my children, they're gonna be better parents than I am, but they're still gonna be imperfect, right? And so forth, but little by little, little by little, we're improving generation to the generation. And that's how eventually we're gonna get to a better world. So I just have to say, you know, g given the way I was raised, I'm doing the best that I can, you know, and 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 that's it. And I'm committed. I I I can share with you guys if you want. It's totally worth it. The woman is amazing, and it's like very very cool. And um, I'm thinking of listening to the guy obsessed. I'm thinking of listening to all her videos write it down 
and then figure out a way of connecting that that particular approach to spiritism and create a lecture for parents. So that's one of my projects now. But I hope I answered your think, question. I think everyone now wants to follow the psychology. So if you can yes, share. Yes, I, I will send it to you. <laughs> I'll send to Anna and then she can share with the group. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, Susanna, already... what, is, what is your Instagram, Susanna? Oh, Susanna Simone's USA? Yes, I have I have Susanna Simões USA, I have Susanna Simões uh, BR, BR for Brazil. So at some point I started separating the content because I had everything together and it was I thought it was hard for the American people to um they are mostly most of my um my postings I have um I do daily reels. Um most of them are I do in both languages. Um Sometimes there are different things on, on one Instagram and another, but uh, yes, there's a lot of material there in English. I have uh, books, entire books that I have uh, done like daily studies and also um, all the materials on my uh, YouTube channel as well. I just started following you. Okay. okay. <laughs> Me too. Susanna, sorry, this one is just singing, but I just no want problem. to say I really appreciate it. I think everything that you told today is just for me. <laughs> and I'm glad. Just for you, nobody else. <laughs> no, because I embrace everything that you mentioned. And I think it's so important for us to talk about this, to discuss. And I put, as Anna mentioned, like I have a bunch of notes here, like what I can do in my life and how I can change and how to be positive. And related to kids, we saw, remember that uh, seminar, Anna, that was, uh, I think the name was Positive Parenting. Yeah. And uh -huh. was like a lot of seminars yeah. saying like how to be better parents yeah. or what we do different in this generation that is uh different for our parents our mm -hmm. grandmothers and things yeah. like that and one thing from that for me that i'm still very struggling with is complaint free parents and i remember the thing it was like you wear a bracelet and every time you complain we change the bracelet to the other arm and I, until this point I, like, i'm not even using anymore because like <laughs> i cannot pass like 24 hours without changing the bracelet yeah. I would say you cannot pass one hour without changing the bracelet. But uh, I think the point is uh, figuring out what we need to improve in our life. Yeah, so yeah. this self-awareness. And this is one thing that I struggle too that you mentioned is how we can um, really find in yourself what we really are, right? And how we can do better. And one thing that you mentioned that was like the hiding thing and how sometimes we're putting ourselves to be busy so we don't look the issues, we don't look the problems that we have because we keep ourselves so busy that we're like, okay, I'm not looking to myself. Let's just do the work, you know. Like There's no do... time for listening. You know, exactly. we, 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 we talk a lot, but we got, you got to listen to the show. And if you're exactly. busy... If your mind is cognitive occupied, there's no space for feeling. And, and, and to listen is to feel, is to allow space for feelings to take place. And that's what we are missing here. And that's where, um, you know, meditation can be so helpful. Uh, just like sometimes, honestly, in the middle of the day, if you can take like literally five minutes at the most and stop, sit still and breathe. Just that, just that. Don't need to close your eyes, and, but just like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit here for five minutes and just breathe and try to focus on your breathing. It's amazing because a lot of times feelings will come up, insights will come up, uh, attention will get diffused. You know what I mean? Stuff. It's like we need to be able to better listen. We 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 talk too much, and sometimes in talking, we also. Um, we, 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 we trick ourselves because the mind is tricky. Uh, but when you feel, there's no tricking. Feelings are what they are. There's no way of, you know, going around feelings and, and they're going to manifest the way they are. So, yeah, finding the time to, to hear. 
Exactly. And one thing that you mentioned too is like when we put in that position to like feel naked, right? And um, embrace who you are. And another thing that you mentioned that is something that we are trying here at home is like how we can expose and seek for help sometimes, right? And especially for a partner, right? That is right by your side. And sometimes we hide even for that person. So right. uh, what we are doing like now at home is like we are commit to talk about for at least 30 minutes every day. Sometimes we just be quiet, but we stay 30 minutes together, just listen one another and not talking. So like one can expose how was the day and how he felt about something that you did. And that is tricky because the other person loves you so much, but mm -hmm. he's able to provide you some input that sometimes you try to hide or you try to not see that you're doing you know over and over again and sometimes these affect not just your relations these affect you and these are so uh, affect your kids and your career and everything and all the persons that are around you so i think it's very insightful and i really uh, appreciate everything that you will say to today and i'm really thankful um Great. This, th just because you guys are talking about listening this week i was in a summit at work in a corporate world and, and um, pub, um, an external speaker came to talk to us and he was talking about that and he brought up a concept that I thought it was very interesting. Um, he brought up the concept of, of um, corporate work and, and all that stuff but I actually took it for life and he was talking about listening how we we you know how, how can we listen to understand instead of listen to respond yeah right because all yeah. the time we, we're listening but we're already thinking about the answer we're going to give. And, and exactly. that, that, is, that is for ourselves too, right? We're listening to ourselves, but we're like trying to justify, well, but I did this because of this. It, like, just listen yeah. to understand, just pause and listen to understand what the other person is saying, what you are saying or feeling, instead of trying to come up with an answer or, an, or a solution right away, right? So as you guys are talking about listening, I just thought about this concept because it stuck with me from, from last week. Yeah, I remember coming home one day uh, from the center where uh, I I had a difficult interchange with uh, someone, and so I'm telling Sherry um, about it, and she asked me, "How curious were you about what the person was saying?" And I'm like, <laughs> "No, well, <laughs> I'm like, what is that, right?" And she's like, "So." You, you can't really be listening to someone if there's no curiosity in you. And I never forgot that because, you know, it's like being curious is being open. It's really trying to, to, to understand, is entering a conversation with a willingness to understand the other side. Um, like I said, usually we don't do that. So without kids, you know, like sometimes another day, um, we were having a conversation with them. My son said something and immediately um, we dismissed his comment as like kind of silly. And then we caught ourselves. So we went back to him and said, you know, I'm sorry, we, we, we want to know more about this. So tell me, you know, so to allow him to, to really share his uh, experience. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's not easy, but um we we we're, we're we're definitely doing better. I I hope than our parents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think this kind of uh, being aware of what we are doing. Um, one thing that um, so uh, that I started doing is to try to be more mindful and present mm -hmm. during the day instead of kind of uh, doing three things at the same time, which we are all very used to. You know, multitasking, right? That's yeah. The, the kind of world we live and I one thing that I noticed that I would always always lose my phone at home mm -hmm. and I would say that the feature in my Apple watch that I used the most was find my iPhone and I I went for a, a retreat for two weeks uh, last month and there was a full detox, emotional, physical, kind of to help with the inflammation, lupus inflammation and everything. So it was the, the full nine yards. And one of the things was um, no technology. 
Uh -huh. And uh, before, like, uh, they start, they ask you to start kind of a transition in two weeks before going to the retreat. So I did. So I left my Apple Watch and I got like a, an old fashioned watch. Uh -huh. And I would say that something magical happened that I don't lose my phone as much. How fun is that? Yeah. Because <laughs> right now I am paying attention where I am leaving my phone. I am like, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm not kind of, a, right. you know, checking all the bing, 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 bing that's going on on my watch yeah. all the time. So yeah. I, I think that as kind of a paying attention and I like the breathing exercise. One thing that I mentioned to um, the class this week is that I've been studying Ayurveda and uh, yoga and um, this past couple of years. I mean, seriously studying like a, mm -hmm. I went back to school. And um, one of the things that you said about the breathing and the meditation is that the breath, breathing can change our mind and our emotions. And we mm -hmm. know that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So kind of us kind of being more attentive in terms of, you know, how we relate to things and kind of be able to pause and regulate. It's this strength is within ourselves, right? So to mm -hmm. kind of get back on track. And sometimes we, we get kind of a pinged by so many areas that what you mentioned about centering and stopping, okay, five minutes. If, if it's not five minutes, it's, you know, five deep breaths, just kind of a, yeah. putting the mm -hmm. hand on your chest, putting the hands on your belly, just feeling kind of a, the diaphragm, diaphragm mm -hmm. kind of a going up and down, that's enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there, there are, there are many ways. Um, I think it's what's important for each person to find what works for you. Mm -hmm. um, people, people identify with different things. I myself practice yoga three times a week. Um, I like that. I, I, I have a lot of uh, feelings coming up. Um, I'm a very high intensity person, so I like the yoga that's a little high intensity because when it comes to the end, I'm so exhausted. You're ready and for Shavasana. <laughs> yeah, when going to Shavasana, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a magical experience for me. The experience of like surrendering. And, and a lot of times I find myself very emotional when I get there because it's like I have released all the defenses of my body and the body is like is shut so it's like no identification with the body it's just like all, all that the emotion like being allowed to 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 surface so it's very powerful so for me it works very well it has something that i have integrated different people will do different things but um you know i i before yoga, I used to run and, um, you know, running also got me in a state of mind that a lot of times, or even just working out, you know, because when I'm working out, it's, it's a moment where I, I stop thinking, I stop, I'm, I'm just focusing on, on something that's very physical. And so since I'm not processing um, my thoughts, then I get inspiration for le lectures, entire dialogues come up just the stuff comes up so you know different things working for different people but just trying to find that space in our lives where we can get to listen to listen to to the feelings um it's, it's really very important with this process Susanna um I just saw that uh, Claudinha sent a, a question saying how we can help our teens to know themselves and love themselves better than, better when they don't want to open up. Okay. Well, by mirroring, right? By mirroring. So are you opening yourself to them, right? Are you sitting down and having honest conversations? Are you disclosing your vulnerabilities? Um, I think that nothing, nothing is more powerful to kids than to watch their parents. Um, you know, and that's how they're going to learn. Maybe you won't get an immediate reaction from them, um, but they will They will keep that. They will have that as a reference for themselves in life. You know, in my house, my parents sat down with me. I saw my mom crying. I saw my mom 
struggling, you know what I mean? And one of the things that I usually tell my kids is, you know, I'm not perfect. You know what the good news is? You don't have to be either. <laughs> and this is so good, you know? So I, I, I think that this is really, um, this is really the best, the best way of teaching is, um, is actually, they're going to mirror what they see. So how, how you manage your feelings, how you manage your humanity or vulnerability is the most powerful message to them. Okay. Thank you so much, Susanna. You're very welcome. You guys are very welcome. Thank yeah, you for thank having you. me. Yeah, <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you. Hope we can see each other more often. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, you can yeah. count on me for, you know, if guys need help with the work in English. I hope to be in your hood one of these days. Yes. Never, so, been, to yeah. that, never been to that part of the country. I would it's, love to be there at yeah. some point. Yeah, with let's my family. plan for that. Yeah, let's plan for that. I, I've been talking to, to Daniel to, uh, to then basically to come and do like a small seminar here oh, in yeah. Portland and then kind of connect with the folks in Seattle. So this is on the works. Oh, so, that would be great. Yeah, that would be so great. And then we'll make and sure then, that uh, you, yeah. you, you get included. And if, if you have in Miami, please make sure to reach out to me and come see us. For sure, for sure. So with that, with a really grateful heart, grateful for this morning that is a, an amazing opening for our weekend a moment that we took to reflect about our lives about ourselves to leave behind all the noise of the material realm to pay attention to what really matters we thank deeply our friend Susanna and at this moment, we present her with a, a big bunch of red flowers with a magical perfume that she can keep on her home as a gift from our hearts. May these flowers illuminate her home, bless her home, bringing peace, love and wisdom. We thank all the celestial spirits who have stayed with us during this time, inspired our conversation. And we ask dear God that you stay with us, not only today, but every day, giving us strength, courage, increasing our faith and inspiring us so we can make better choices every single day. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Thank you, guys. Thank have you. A great day over there. A, Bye -bye. a pleasure to have you here.